Just a reminder, today's conference is being recorded. Okay, so once again, I'm Laura Brandis with the Polis Water Sustainability Project, and I want to welcome all of you to this second webinar in Polis's Creating a Blue Dialogue webinar series. Today's discussion will focus on the topic of peeling back the pavement, um, or the idea of reinventing rainwater management in Canada's communities. And with this webinar series, we successfully bring together expert water practitioners, thinkers, and decision makers from all across the country to share perspectives and expertise on new and emerging water policy issues and best practices. So I certainly welcome you all here today. Before we get going, I want to extend a thank you to all of our sponsors and partners of this year's Creating a Blue Dialogue webinar series specifically FLOW, the Forum for Leadership on Water, the Polis Project on Ecological Governance, the Canadian Water Network, Walter and Duncan Gordon Foundation, Water Canada Magazine, and the Living Water Policy Project. If you're new to Now, for those of you who have been signed in for a while, you certainly know the drill on muting the phone line. If you have not yet pressed star six on your keypad and heard a voice telling you that your phone is muted, Please do so now. Um, this helps to reduce extraneous noise during the presentations, any background noise. Um, and I actually don't have the ability to mute you myself, so if you can please make a point of that. Um, and you can check that your line is muted in the attendees column. You'll see all the phone numbers. And if you find your phone number there and you don't have a little red um, do not disturb sign through your telephone, it means that your line is not yet muted. Okay, so a bunch of you are already giving online introductions. If you missed me saying that, um, I invite you now to write in the chat box who you are, who you're with, and also how many people are listening on your end. This is a great way to get a sense of community in this virtual meeting room um, so we can have an idea of who we're with here today. And the last rule or, um, that I want to go over is um, questions. So we're going to hear presentations from our speakers, and at the end, we're going to open up the floor to questions. And as with your introductions, you can just type those questions in the chat box, and I will be moderating those. So I encourage you to leave your questions till the end, um, just to ensure that I see them. Um, but I will try to keep my eye open and catch any questions that come in. Questions will be answered in a first-come, first-served manner. If there are any extra questions at the end that are left hanging after our time period is up, we will address those. Um, I'll send them to the speakers, and I can include the answers to those in the summary note that is circulated after the webinar. Okay, today's webinar is a little bit different than usual because it actually marks the launch of the newest water sustainability project research report. This is a handbook um, for community leaders, decision makers, municipal water management staff called Peeling Back the Pavement, a blueprint for reinventing rainwater management in Canada's communities. So this is a 67-page handbook, and the electronic version is now available for download. I'm sure some of you may have already seen it in the um, login information email that I sent out. So if you're interested in that, I encourage all of you to head over to polislaterproject.org slash publication, slash 426. And today we have two speakers with us. The first is a colleague of mine here at The Water Project, Suzanne porter Box, and she is the lead author of Peeling Back the Pavement. And as Community Water Coordinator at The Water Sustainability Project, she focuses on enhancing water conservation capacity in communities across Canada through water soft path planning pilot projects and through the development of practical tools for local government. And Suzanne is also an associate with Water Lucian, a role in which she coordinates and facilitates workshops on local water issues for youth and young professionals across British Columbia. And our second speaker today is special guest Patrick Lucy. He is a senior aquatic ecologist and president of Aquatech Scientific Consulting Limited. Mr. Lucy has over 35 years of practical experience managing water resources to add value to development projects and also to demonstrate how enhancement of ecological function can provide significant cost savings on infrastructure and create a healthier environment. 
He's a specialist in the design and construction of quality integrated water management systems, and he is well respected for his ecologically sound and innovative approaches to protecting water resources. So at this point, I'm going to hand the mic over to Suzanne, and she is going to start this webinar off. So Suzanne, if your line is muted, please press star six to bring your voice back on. All right. Thanks, Laura. You're welcome. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Suzanne here from a just about to be rainy Victoria. I'm looking out our window here, and it's a beautiful fall day. The sky is gray and cloudy, a perfect day to talk about rainwater management. So as Laura mentioned, um, I am the lead author on our new publication. Of course, I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Oliver Brandis, who is the Water Sustainability Project Lead and Associate Director at POLIS as well as Calvin Sanborn, who's at the UVic Environmental Law Center and who also authored an earlier report that we in part based this report on, and with the support of our poll communications director, who we've been listening to already this morning, um, Laura Brandes. So peeling back the pavement, who's the target audience for this, um, for this handbook? Well, it's part of a handbook series that we've actually got, um, Thinking Beyond Pipes and Pumps, Worth Every Penny might be a couple titles that you're familiar with. And really, this is a resource for decision makers, for community leaders, and for local government staff who want to take action to improve urban stormwater management. Um, and just as a starting point here, we recognize that there have been many, many reports and projects that have uh, carefully documented and cataloged the damage caused by urban stormwater runoff as well as offer detailed prescriptions, and that many communities across Canada are already working really hard to attempt to improve on conventional stormwater management. But what's different about what we're going to be talking about with you here is that we're going beyond the question of what are the problems with stormwater runoff, and instead we're essentially asking how can we move beyond current best practices? How can we use rain as a resource? and how can we prevent the problem of runoff altogether. So that's what we're using as a starting point here. Now I'm going to start with a little parable here. And I want you just to settle back for a second and picture a city in your mind. That, now picture that it's raining in that city. So in this community, it's very likely the one that you probably live in, you see rain falling on your standard urban landscape of concrete and asphalt and roofs. And this community is mostly made of impermeable, uh, impermeable surfaces. So that means that as the rain is falling, water is flowing down the street and into storm sewers where it's being quickly piped away to a receiving body of water, say, for example, a local creek or lake or an ocean. Now in your mind, picture another city likely a city that unfortunately you don't currently live in. And in this second city, the rainy picture is actually really different. There's a whole lot of less concrete and there's a lot less asphalt. And so very little water is actually running down these storm drains as the, the rain comes down. And that's because there's green infrastructure everywhere. There's downspouts connected to rainwater cisterns. There's green roofs and rain gardens and deep soiled lawns and sidewalks with planter boxes, etc. And in this city, rain is really seen as a valuable resource that is managed to essentially mimic the natural water cycle. So we're going to call this first city that we were thinking about, and we'll, we'll just say that it's the one on the left on the screen in front of you, the stormwater city. And the second city, the one on the right, we're going to call the rainwater city. And just as we, we're about to head off from this slide, what separates really these two cities, so the stormwater city on the left and the rainwater city from the right, isn't something like uh, geology or wealth or climate, but really the degree to which the water cycle has been integrated into the very fabric of the, er, the urban environment. So this is our starting point for peeling back the pavement, the tale of two cities. All right, well, I'm going to assume that we have a sophisticated audience. I've seen everyone who's attending, um, and I think we know what the problems are, what's kind of how we're doing things. 
how we're doing things now. And I think that we can all agree that we have not yet mastered how to manage wet weather effectively in our communities. So from polluted beaches to uh, ruined aquatic habitat to this critical last point, expensive drainage infrastructure that demands constant maintenance, these are all reasons that we should care about um, stormwater. And just a little quick point here, um, there was an article that appeared in Water Canada a few months ago written by Kevin Mercer who pointed to um, a few stats that are coming out of the Insurance Bureau of Canada which said that water damage claims from 20 to 50 percent of all property-related claims within Canada. So this is a huge um, increase in, in the value of insurance claims with stormwater ar arguably constituting kind of one of the largest risks to municipalities posed by a changing climate. <clears throat> so all of these concerns and the, the problems with kind of the way that we're managing stormwater now are really the legacy of old stormwater management practices that we can attribute to three root problems. And I'm going to talk about these three root problems in just a sec. Together, these three root problems comprise what we're calling the stormwater city. All right, well, the first one, concrete jungle design that creates runoff. So building cities has, has always meant replacing the natural landscape, what we think of the natural landscape, so forests and wetlands and grasslands, with streets and parking lots and rooftops and other hard surfaces. So rather than designing urban infrastructure to absorb water the way nature does, what we do is we're actually creating the problem of runoff by using all these impermeable surfaces in our construction. Then the second part of this problem is that to deal with all of this runoff that we've created, we have to in turn create elaborate, massively expensive drainage, infra in drainage infrastructure that's really expensive to build and is even more expensive to maintain over its lifespan. Problem two, so rainwater down the drain, waste of a valuable resource. Well, rainfall as a threat means that the communities miss the opportunity to capture and store rainwater for reuse because it's being shunted down the drain. So let me just tell out what this means. Transporting rainwater away from a property via storm drains at the exact same time that water is being piped into the very same property from a municipality centralized supply system, for example, translates into missed opportunities to use this rainfall as a non-potable water source for our, own, for our own use. And really in this era of um, you know, a whole number of concerns, strained infrastructure capacity, diminishing municipal budget, uh, frequent, frequent water shortages in, in certain parts of our country here, why waste rainwater and why not use it on site for non-drinking uh, water purposes. So, so this missed opportunity really comes at a great cost. And this last, this last problem again that we're identifying as a stormwater city is, is one that we believe really makes our approach to this topic unique and builds on, on uh, some of the good work that's already out there. And when we're talking about stormwater and its associated problems, we have to be clear on two things really. One, who's in charge of what? and to how are decisions getting made about stormwater. So at the moment, local governments are ultimately in, in uh, charge of managing stormwater in Canada. However, ultimately, urban water management decisions, and this is the first point on the slide here, are made in a fragmented way with no one entity responsible for the, for the whole water cycle. So let me just quickly explain this, this point, because it's an important one for our basis here. Like many services that are provided by local governments relating to environmental concerns, water and watershed management is divided between levels of local and senior government and across various departments within local governments as well. So even though land and water are part of one natural system, they're actually rarely integrated in our management of them. For example, treatment, drinking water, and sometimes source protection decisions might be made by one department in a regional government. Another department might be responsible for, for sewers. Um, a separate planning department deals with land use decisions, so things like zoning and community development, which very much impact local water resources. And individual municipalities 
are responsible for different aspects of the physical infrastructure within their mutually exclusive boundaries, even though they might be situated close to one another. So the result is really a complex patchwork of actors and legislation that creates a system with often competing um, objectives and with generally siloed decisions. So again, these three core concepts, we won't spend any more time on them, I think we're very familiar with these, really illustrate the character and problems with uh, our conventional pipe and convey approach to stormwater management. All right, well ultimately, the argument that we're making here is that in incremental improvements to stormwater likely will not address these root problems. So this means that our solution has to be not in improving um, the old paradigm, the way that we do things now, because that really only is gonna perpetuate the problem by creating more impermeable surface, more runoff, et cetera. So what we need to do is focus the solutions on fundamentally changing city design and growth patterns to avoid as much runoff as possible in the first place from forming, from forming in order to maintain and rehabilitate uh, watershed health and function, which really is our ultimate goal here. And this is what the Rainwater City aims to do. And right now I'm gonna describe the three core design principles that are really crucial for moving from a stormwater paradigm to what we're calling a rainwater paradigm. All right, well this first one is, is an obvious one and one that uh, many communities are already working on to, to different ex extents. And that's the widespread implementation of green infrastructure, uh, some folks might also know this as low-impact in development across the community. So this means replacing curbs and gutters with things that we, we know well as, as green infrastructure, grassy swales, uh, planting wildflower meadows rather than turf, for example, along median, medians in an open space, porous pavement, etc. cetera. Um, and many communities, as I mentioned, have good examples of LID or green infrastructure projects here and there. However, the key is to have this idea of build it better as a core build and rebuild that is retrofit value in the community so that it really becomes business as usual. In addition to the widespread implementation of uh, green infrastructure, rainwater is embraced as the resource that it really is in the rainwater city. So I'm gonna assume that we all know what rainwater harvesting is and jump ahead and say that uh, a systemic approach to rainwater harvesting, the one that we're suggesting here, involves more than simply uh, implementing a standard kind of run-of-the-mill rain barrel rebate program for homeowners, for example. This is an important early step. However, true rainwater management focuses on the widespread and integrated use of uh, rainwater harvesting across the community. Excuse me, so that rainwater is really viewed as uh, um, a legitimate and decentralized water supply source. So in the rainwater city, rain does the work, we've got let rain do the work here, rain does the work of meeting many non-potable demands, uh, water demands. And this last principle, which is new governance, so an integrated watershed-based approach to managing wet weather across our communities. Now, as the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, has noted, rainwater must be managed on a watershed scale. We take the same position um, here, as do a growing number of organizations. Uh, many of you on the line here, I see communities, uh, research, including, I might add, uh, the BC Water and Waste Association, which very recently released its um, its position statement on stormwater, and I'm just gonna read you a quick quote here. It reads, in order to protect water quality and the public, every community should adopt an integrated watershed-based approach to stormwater management, which emphasizes on-site reduction and retention as the best practice and recognizes the need to maintain and enhance existing infrastructure. And that's just a uh, position statement from the BC Water and Waste Association. And the second piece of this new governance in, in the rainwater paradigm is to reorganize internal local government structures <laughs> to really enable planning and cooperation across departments. So this is to fully empower comprehensive land and water use planning 
in every community project. And together, these core concepts, the one we've just run over, build it better, let do, rain do the work, and new governance, really illustrate the character and the potential of the rainwater city. So some of you might be wondering, what's the difference between best practices of stormwater management and this rainwater management that, um, that we're talking about here? Well, what, what I've done is, I, is I've extracted a page from our handbook and plunked it in right here. And I'm just going to draw your attention to the last two columns. So um, again, the critical point being the difference between um, enhanced stormwater management or best practices stormwater management does not mean doing old things better. Again, it means fundamentally shifting with rainwater management, our relationship with water in our daily lives and in how we plan and how we make decisions about our communities, really in order to harness the, the, the full spectrum of nature services in our cities. Um, so we've got, for example, the issue, um, the way viewed through a stormwater management best practices lens would be to mitigate the negative impacts of conventional urban development on ecosystems by improving runoff quality and reducing runoff volume. Whereas through a rainwater management lens, it sees the issue as preventing runoff altogether and harvest rainfall for non-potable use through an ecosystem-based approach to rainwater management. And again, the solution through a stormwater management best practices lens would see it as a need to supplement large-scale drainage infrastructures of the kind that we've already got a lot of um, with on-site and end-of-pipe measures that will improve runoff quality and reduce runoff volume. So there's some attention to, to ecosystem concerns there. But again, with the rainwater management approach, the solution is really to fully rehabilitate urban ecosystem function by, again, maximizing the use of rain as a resource and managing wet weather through um, green infrastructure as, as the main infrastructure. And I'm just going to um, pop over to this next um, slide really quickly that there's a really uh, very compelling business case to be made for rainwater management. <coughs> this is something that our next speaker, Patrick Lucy, is going to be touching on. But I've just plucked out a couple examples for you here. There are many, many more in the handbook, including a couple of case studies. So this first one is an analysis conducted by the City of Vancouver showed that uh, incorporating green infrastructure into locations with existing conventional stormwater controls would cost only a little bit more, marginally more, than rehabilitating the conventional system. And introducing green infrastructure into new development would cost less. And then the next one here, in the city of Portland, the uh, Bureau of Environmental Services there is going to save more than $58 million U.S through the large-scale integration of green infrastructure um, in its Brooklyn project. And the total cost of this project is going to be 40% less than the cost of traditional infrastructure solutions would be. So some compelling cases in addition to the ecological benefits um, of a rainwater management approach. Now on to the real meat here, and I'm keeping an eye on the clock. So I, I realize that we need to kind of skip, skip through this next part quickly. Um, something that was really important to us while we were writing this um, with, our, with our reviewers and with the, our colleagues that, that helped us kind of really turn this into a, um, a good, solid research report, we've all seen lots of presentations um, and read books and articles, had conversations that focus on the problem, that maybe they'll lightly touch on the solution, and they'll ignore the practical steps to get from one to the other. But with peeling back, you'll find that over half of this handbook actually describes in detail practical actions and ideas for implementing rainwater principles. So we're not going to leave you hanging with um, all of these things that we've just been talking about. What we've done is designed a series of what we're calling blueprints that essentially outline a process for weaving the three principles of the rainwater city into a coherent approach to rainwater management. And I'm going to touch on a couple of those blueprints in just a few, few seconds. But it just, okay. I'll just outline these three points on this slide to, to remember as we move through um, the blueprint. One, 
is... Well, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you for a minute, Suzanne. Um, I think there's a couple of people who, who don't have their lines we muted. Are, hi, how are you? Hello. <laughs> uh, would you mind pressing star six on your telephone keypad? Um, just to remove any background noise while Suzanne's speaking. Thanks so much. Sorry, Suzanne, continue. Oh, thanks, Laura. Um, yes, so I was just going to touch on a couple points on this slide um, before we head into the blueprint. The uh, principles of the rainwater city, the purposes of these are really to better inform current, current water management practices. I think, I think this is clear. Mm. The key point that we're really trying to bring to the fore here is that untangling and correcting urban water governance, so the way that we make decisions about water in our communities is key to making this, uh, the rainwater city a reality in Canada. And the last point is a really positive point, which is that local governments already have access to many of the key tools that are needed to, to help make this a reality. So zoning bylaws, for example, are among the most powerful tools that municipalities will have to regulate rainwater um, through land use. All right. Now remember, on the left-hand side here, you're going to see the three principles that I've just been discussing. discussing. So these three principles, build it better, let rain do the work, new governance, these represent a comprehensive whole. Now in the blueprint, which I'm going to show you in, in the next slide, I promise, we outline a, um, a suite of actions for each principle. And each action, in turn, is linked to an associated outcome. So these are what you see on the right-hand column here. Can you see my, hopefully you can see my arrow. There we go. These are the uh, four tangible outcomes that we've chosen as important goals of um, rainwater management principles. So these are improved runoff quality, reduced runoff volume, enhanced asset management, and watershed governance. All right, on your screen, you're seeing what we call our master blueprint for the rainwater city. And let's walk through this, uh, get, uh, this together. So on the top here, you see the three principles that we've just been, we, we, that we've just been talking about. Sorry, build it better, let rain do the work, and watershed governance. On this left-hand column, you're going to see who's actually in charge of implementing it. So we've got local government with this icon and senior government in charge of implementing um, these, these actions. It, each of the columns for each of the principles has a series of actions. Um, so for example, here we've got create incentives for green infrastructure, uh, and under let rain do, do the work, we've got develop local government support and guidelines, et cetera. I'm going to drill down on a couple of these uh, in just a second. And in turn, each of these actions link to the outcomes that I was talking about on the previous slide. The legend is right here. So say, for example, you're looking for an action in your community that will reduce the runoff volume. Well, you can look up for the icons um, with this uh, kind of rainwater cistern and look and see what actions actually connect with that. So for example, set effective permeability slash impermeability targets for the region. Now, the actions described under each of these principles support and reinforce one another, and they're intended to be implemented as a suite across all the communities that, that uh, share a watershed. So for example, as uh, communities adopt a new governance model indicated here um, that provides a funding mechanism for rainwater projects and uh, acts to you know, increase coordination between municipalities that share a watershed, implementing rainwater systems and green infrastructure across the watershed becomes more, more desirable. And I just want to quickly point out on the slide, those of you who are wondering why there are fewer actions for senior governments to take than local governments, it's not that there are less actions um, for senior management to take on stormwater uh, slash rainwater management en masse. But remember who our audience is for the handbook. We wanted to focus on actions largely for local governments. That was the master blueprint, but as I mentioned, each of the rainwater principles also has its own blueprint with specific actions. So this is the blueprint for the first rainwater principle, um, build it better. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through how we've laid out each of these kind of sub blueprints. So what we've done is organized what we have identified as the key first steps 
um, and put it in its, its own category, and then identified next steps. Again, remember that on the left-hand side, you're seeing the icons for who would actually implement those. So this, we remember, is our local government icon and senior government. So we've identified creating incentives for green infrastructure as something that both senior government and local government would be, um, would be uh, responsible for. So in terms of local government responsibilities, it would be creating incentives for property owners and developers to adopt green infrastructure um, practices. So this is zoning, could be expedited permitting, favorable zoning allowances, et cetera. There's also disincentives that can be introduced. When it comes to sharing the weight with senior government, this is something that senior government and municipalities should link all infrastructure funding to basic green infrastructure requirements. So this is kind of where both, both levels of government are working together to make this happen. Again, remember on the right, we've got the um, outcomes, and with this first step, we can see that the outcomes are improved runoff quality, reduced runoff volume, and enhanced asset management. Now, the next step for this, for this principle, we've got a number of them here again. I'll just go through a couple. Um, this first one is a local government jurisdiction implementing rainwater utility charges. So this is really where charges, um, property owners are charged with fees based on their actual use of the stormwater system, just like we do with water. And there are um, many communities across Europe and a small handful, um, including Halifax here in Canada, that are starting to implement these rainwater utility charges. And we've got a, another a bunch of other um, next steps you can see here, mandate runoff neutral standards for all new developments and redevelopments. Um, and one that focuses on quality as well here in Stall End of Pipe runoff treatment where needed. And again, this is, you can see from the page number on the bottom, I just plucked it right from um, our report here. And because we're on limited time here, I'll let you um, investigate that and explore that on your own when you download the report. This next one, I'm just going to show you again this, this third blueprint, um, just again to give you a flavor of the kind of solutions that we're offering. Um, for the new governance for um, rainwater management. Again, we're advocating here an integrated watershed-based approach. Um, as a first step here, we have um, offered the idea of integrating water service departments, so merging water departments so that drinking water supply, storm water, and wastewater are managed as a single system that really mimics the natural water cycle. And again, there are examples of communities here in Canada, Toronto, again, Halifax, that have these integrated, um, integrated water services departments. Now, the second one is, some, is an idea that we're really um, excited about. i uh, be curious to hear people's thoughts on this, it, perhaps if it comes up in the question period. This is the idea of establishing a regional water commission agency or authority um, you know, it's one thing to say, well, let, let's do watershed-based planning. Okay, well, wh what kind of, what infrastructure do we need in place? What institutions do we have that we can build on to make that a reality? Well, what, what we're proposing here is to establish a regional water commission, an agency or an authority that really has a clear mandate to address watershed-level issues and decision-making powers, specifically as they relate to land use decisions that impact water resources. So this can take a range of different forms. It can be funded by something that I mentioned on the, on the previous slide, which would be a rainwater utility charge. Now, I just want to quickly point out down here that in some jurisdictions, there are already regional governments or regional bodies that already fulfill some of these, these roles, such as uh, conservation authorities in Ontario, regional districts here in BC. And again, the, the goal of, of this kind of coordinating body is to really formalize that coordination between all relevant jurisdictions and municipalities so that watershed level management is actually happening. And I know I am I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to um, skip along. Again, I encourage you to please look. This is um, the, the part that I find most um, compelling and new about this this report that we've put together for you here is really these blueprints um, describing how, how communities can take these steps. And I should just point out very quickly that each of these steps have, we have a number of case studies from Canada and beyond, so internationally as well, that explore communities that have had success with, with implementing um, some of these actions. Thank you,
So just in the home stretch here, um, <coughs> really the rainwater city, the, the city that we've just been describing, tells one possible tale of the future. So it's cities that grow and that are retrofitted to have less concrete and minimize runoff and that really use rain as a primary water supply and making sure that land and water management decisions are, are really integrated and made on a watershed basis, as we've already said uh, a few times, is key to making this story um, a reality. So there's lots of communities uh, across the world that are already putting the different principles of, of the rainwater city or the rainwater management into action. Uh, in the states, we've got Philadelphia, Portland and Seattle could be considered leaders. Here in Canada, we've got Victoria, um, Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, Halifax, just a few leaders, many other smaller communities in British Columbia and Ontario as well. However, really the full vision of the rainwater city has yet to be realized in, in Canada. No community here in our part of the world has yet managed to incorporate all of these elements um, to, to really catalyze a new era of designing with nature and water-centric municipal planning. And no community, again, in our part of the world, it might be different in the global south, I would suggest, um, is truly built around using rain as a resource, at least not yet. And so transitioning to a rainwater city, as I've mentioned twice before now, does not mean doing old things better. It means fundamentally shifting the way that we use water, the way that we plan around water in our daily lives. And in turn, this, this means that we have to see rain differently, see wet weather differently, um, break out of old habits, think and act on new design principles, and really harness the full spectrum of nature services in our cities. Um, last, a second last slide here, as I mentioned, as Laura mentioned as well, peeling back the pavement. This is part of our Polis Water Sustainability Project Handbook series. We've got three other in the series, all for local governments and decision makers, community leaders, and all available for free, downloadable off our website. And I just wanted to thank um, our funders and our communications partners, especially we've got BCWWA, CWWA, and Action H2O, as well as many, many of our peer reviewers, many of whom I see are on the call today. Um, thank you so much for, for your time and um, support for this project. So with that, um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Patrick Lucy of Aquatex, and just as he kind of gets settled and unmutes his line, I'll just give a little quickie background that Polis is um, a big fan of the work that Patrick and his colleagues are doing, and we're really, really excited to, to have you with us today, Patrick. And Patrick is a, a cutting-edge researcher and um, aquatic ecologist here in Victoria who will never hesitate to make sure that you know and understand the science behind the things that you're talking about. So we're very grateful to him for his um, consistent reminders that what we're ultimately after here are um, properly functioning ecosystems. So he's also a practitioner with many years of on-the-ground experience. Um, Patrick, thanks so much, and take it away. Thank you, Suzanne. I'll wait till my slides are click kicked over. So, thank you for the opportunity to present, and Suzanne's given me an excellent um, segue into what I would like to present over the next 20 or 30 minutes, and that is a series of case studies that document how one implements the three design principles that um, I just described. And the first slide that I have here is a photograph, uh, two photographs of the city of Vancouver taken, <coughs> excuse me, 100 years apart. And I'm just going to interrupt again, Patrick. Um, I'm sorry, we're hearing background noise on the line again. If your line is not muted, please press star six. You can check if you're muted, scroll down the uh, list of attendees and find your phone number um, and see if you have a little do not disturb red symbol um, over your telephone. Thanks so much. Sorry, Patrick. That's okay. And so what we see is a city very typical of what cities looked like coming out of the 19th century, um, still not really auto-centric. 
um, low density, very little um, urban uh, high density development. And within 100 years, what we see is a very typical urban core. And in order to make that transition from 1910 to 2010, um, two things had to change. Cities had to have access to a great deal more water and energy. And along the way, as Suzanne pointed out, we have taken the old 2,500-year Roman design principles and essentially kept them completely intact. And the only difference between that photo in 2010 and what a Roman city looked like in terms of design process is that city in 2010 has structural steel and electric motors to move fluids around. So the challenge is to simply change fundamentally the way we design, and that is to adopt a design with nature uh, set of principles. And the key principle that nature uses on terrestrial landscapes is actually very simple. It's capture, store, beneficial use. There isn't time today to go into all of the science that we've worked out with our American colleagues over the last 20 years on this, and I'll touch on that in a moment, but what I would like to do is walk you through how over the last 15 or 20 years we've used these principles to rethink how we build. And I'm going to start with small scale and end up at the city scale. So we're all very familiar with nature's water cycle, and the cycle on the left, the blue water cycle, is the one that we're all mostly familiar with. This is the big cycle, and we almost never talk about the cycle on the right, which is the green water cycle. What we've learned in the last less than 10 years, and much of this has come out of forestry research, is that <clears throat> water is recycled using very short closed loops on the land. And so 65% of nature's water cycle on the terrestrial side of the equation actually takes place within the soils and the vegetation. Only a small portion of that is actually as surface water in our streams and uh, rivers and ponds. Suffice it to say that I think everybody's well aware that as we change land use, we affect that small water cycle. And if you think of that picture in 2010 in Vancouver, we've essentially eliminated it completely from the equation. And we're not going to go back and put in, you know, urban forests to reestablish that cycle. But there are many, many other ways to close that loop and significantly increase the percentage of water that falls in our modern cities that cycles through that green um, microcycle. I've borrowed this slide from a colleague, uh, Nick Ashbolt, um, from Australia, currently on loan to the EPA. Essentially, for the last 2,500 to 3,500 years, our urban design, seen on the left, uses water and energy once, and we end up producing waste that we have to get rid of. This is an open linear system, and the design practice is least cost compliance. What's the least amount of money the taxpayer needs to spend in order to be compliant with some municipal, state or provincial or federal regulation? The challenge we face is the last estimate I saw to rebuild and to build the new infrastructure for the 1,800 new cities the world must build between now and 2045, and each one of those cities will be the size of Vancouver, is $30 trillion for municipal infrastructure. There isn't that kind of financing available, and I think most people are aware of the kinds of problems that governments at all levels are facing. So we need literally a cultural shift to the one on the right. And this is a closed loop system based on resource recovery that generates revenues or significantly reduces costs, not only capital costs, but operating and maintenance costs. And I'm gonna walk you through how we've done some of this. So the key in that design with nature principle is to balance development, any development, on ecological stability. The slide that I have here 
is actually the incorrect way. Here we're focusing a balance that's only on the value. And fish, that four-letter F word we're never supposed to use in public, I think it's like that other one, free. Fish is a value. You don't get fish until you've actually built in all of the rest of the micro microbial ecology. And we begin with hydrology. We address vegetation, soils, primary production, invertebrates, and then you get the fish. So when you have a sound, stable ecosystem, you generate all of the values that we're interested in in society. The next slide lays this out graphically. So beginning on the right-hand side of the slide, there are five different um, illustrations that describe the health of a creek, or in the case of State A, it could be an urban ditch. Moving from State A, this is a system that we call non-functional. None of the processes and attributes that should be present in a healthy system are present, and it's essentially a channel for moving water quickly, but there are almost no values present in systems that look like State A. As you add more and more of these processes and attributes that should be present in a stream on whatever landscape you're looking at, you move through state B, C, D, and ultimately to state E, which is a perfectly healthy system. If you then look at the left-hand side of the um, diagram, what you see is a list of those streams, A through E, and down in the bottom, running on the x-axis, what you have are a whole series of threshold points where resource values kick in. Note that none of the values that we are interested in as a society kick in until you achieve state C, which is essentially the minimum functional condition or the minimum set of processes and attributes. Bear in mind that the key stressor that we're having to address here is hydrological. These are large events, 25, 30 year events, that the system can either handle through resistance or resilience attributes, or it can't even handle a five year storm event and it just tears itself apart. So the key is always understanding the hydrology. Very difficult for an ecologist to, like myself to admit that this is actually about the physics, but that's actually what we're talking about. So the question is, without going into any of the science that is summed up in that one slide, which is far beyond uh, the ability to cover in this webinar, how do we use that science to rethink design? So essentially we have to shift, as this next slide, Valuing Nature's Infrastructure, shows. We've engaged in conventional engineering, put it in a pipe and get it off the land as fast as possible for thousands of years. We need to move through environmental engineering, which we did in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the early part of this new century, where the noun is engineering and the adjective is environmental, to engineered ecology. We just need to reverse the noun and the adjective. So this slide is literally of three different stormwater or rainwater management practices. <laughs> within three blocks of each other here in the city of Victoria, and the only question that I would like all of you to ask and answer is which one would you like to live beside? The one on the right is one that we're gonna um, look at next. So this was a pair of subdivisions that uh, we were brought in to help design. So I've got, um, I'm trying to, I'm not sure, um, I'm trying to use the arrow, but it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, Laura, are you able to help me with this? Uh, yep, yeah, it's on the screen. Just oh, there click, it is. Okay. Click on the arrow with your mouse. Yep, yeah, there you go. I've got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Two subdivisions. There was a previous subdivision that we uh, just worked on in the upper left-hand corner, and then a more recent subdivision in the lower right-hand corner. The Urban stream is the light yellow or light blue um, moving from the right to the left and old subdivisions and we were brought in 
to work on essentially stormwater management, which was a requirement of the design process in the municipality of Saanich. What we asked the developer to do was to give up 20% of his property in order that we could rebuild the wetlands and the stream channels on, this, on these two sites when in fact he's legally required only to give up 5% for a cash value in lieu of giving up the 5%. The rationale for giving up 20% of the land will become apparent in the next couple of slides. So here's the project as we began. Keep your eye on these um, poplars up in the upper right-hand corner. This was 1999. This was a few years after the subdivision began. There are those trees in the background. This is what it looked like in 2008. There's no point in putting the 2011 slide on here because there's nothing but a wall of green. This is one of the small wetland ponds that we built, and this is what it looked like 18 months later. Now the key in understanding this design process is these are completely integrated ecosystems. These are not detention ponds. These are fully functional ecosystems. And one of the reasons for that, of course, increasingly are concerns about insect vectors, um, West Nile virus, all that sort of thing. And of course, we don't have any of these problems in these wetlands because all of these insects, particularly in the larval stage, are targeted by predators in these functional landscapes. But here's why the developer would do this. The next slide is taken from a, a document we prepared for uh, CMHC, which was on the financial rationale behind all of our developments on subdivisions. And the left-hand column is what the traditional approach for the municipality would have been, do it the old way versus the new way. On the right-hand side are the costs for the developer or the revenues that were generated. Using traditional approaches, it would have cost them a quarter of a million dollars. Taking this ecological approach, that is a design with nature approach, giving up 20% of the land, he made a million dollars more than he would have otherwise. Why was that? Because in giving up 20% of the land, he received a bonus density option, which he exercised, and at the end of the day, he installed less municipal infrastructure, and now the municipality has less infrastructure that they need to manage over the next coming decades. In the same watershed, so we're staying within the same um, subcatchment area of a major salmon system in Victoria, the Colorado River, there was an old, uh, there's a, a farm with a, a historical drainage channel that is, get water off the land as fast as possible. And there was an option to rebuild essentially a kilometer of that channel, reestablishing the ecology of the stream system in this upper watershed. The next slide shows what that landscape looked like in 2000. So this was a project we did in combination with the one I just talked to you about in the subdivision. The upper right-hand um, embedded photo shows a typical drainage ditch all of the processes and attributes that should be present in a functional creek are missing. That's how we know this is a good drainage ditch. And the green arrow literally lays out where that photograph was taken. There's the ditch splitting the farmer's field in half. On the far left-hand side is a public walking trail that used to be a rail line, and this is a rails-to-trails pro project. So here's what we did on the next slide. This is May 2006, five years later. We simply moved the drainage ditch up against the rails to trails, taking advantage of all of that vegetation. So we've got a built-in riparian structure. <clears throat> and we've designed a channel that incorporates all of the processes and attributes that should be present in a functional ecosystem. So what are the benefits that accrue when we do that? We ended up with one field, one irrigation system, no bridges, 13% more arable land because we got rid of three roads that were in on, on the property. We've restored the floodplain. We use 40% less water because the farmer can now use water from the stream, for which he has a water license, 
to sub-irrigate his fields because we installed that irrigation system, that subsurface irrigation system, in that old drainage ditch before we filled it in. This is part of a uh, change in his management practices. He no longer uses pesticides on this land. Rather, he uses an integrated pest management approach. And, of course, what we've created is a huge amount of bird habitat, and the birds literally move out of these riparian zones and clean up large quantities of pests. If he was growing berry crops, we would adopt a very different approach because we wouldn't want the birds going after his uh, berries. But at the bottom of the slide is perhaps the most important feature. Not only is he saving money in not using chemicals and the obvious benefits to the ecology and not putting those chemicals on the land, but it cost us $300,000 to build this, and the net present value to the farmer was $500,000. The farmer didn't spend any money on this because we were able to get all of the funding to do this as a demonstration project. And he's now incorporating this type of thinking on all of the other streams on the properties that he um, farms around the region. The next project I want to walk you through is Dockside Green. So we're going to shift from the peri-urban subdivision, relatively low-density landscapes, to the downtown core. So this is um, in the city of Victoria. It's in a different watershed. It's now on the um, edge of the marine environment. And the lower uh, photograph inset on the right is what this old industrial, abandoned industrial brownfield site looked like. And the larger picture is the artist illustration of what the community will look like at full build out probably sometime in the next 10 years. This is the first lead platinum um, community in the world, and the only way to make this project potentially viable was to integrate water and energy as the basis of its overall design. So taking an integrated design approach actually created enhanced value. We adopted an approach where we would not put water in pipes. It would be rainwater capture and on-site wastewater management on the site the intent of the design process was to celebrate water and at the same time generate financial value. I won't go into the details, but essentially we took an engineered ecology closed loop design, the focus of which was to enhance financial value on a site that otherwise you couldn't run a pro forma uh, successfully. I'm not going to go into the details, but I just want to walk you through one element in order to generate this value and to close the loop and celebrate water, a de decision, design decision was made to build literally a, a wildland stream on the property in the middle of the city center. And I just want to show you what that stream looks like. This was April 2009. After we'd finished the buildings, people were starting to move in, and the stream channel had been constructed. That's what it looked like. In June of the same year, and what's intriguing is the number of kids that now actually play in the stream, and here are a couple of kids fascinated by the algal production uh, that was occurring. There's fish in this system. We have every kind of wildlife you can imagine, and a couple of uh, months ago, a couple of seals climbed up out of the marine environment and actually waddled along the stream channel looking for food. <laughs> I want to shift topics. Um, I think most people are fairly familiar with Dockside Green. One of the challenges that Suzanne raised and that is addressed, I think, as in many, many different places in Peeling Back the Pavement is this concept of watershed scale planning. In another community here in Victoria called the City of Colwood, um, we've been working on a project now for the last three years, which is a small subcatchment of one of the two major streams that flows through this community. This is Latoria Creek, and I'm going to use the green arrow just to indicate where that creek flows. So it begins in a complex of wetlands in the upper left-hand side of the picture, 
and then it flows essentially as a drainage ditch alongside the road and then down through a park which is wooded and in the last three years on the south side of this road and then up in this corner where the green arrow is is a whole series of small developments and this is very typical of what happens in our cities the development process forces the developer to focus only on the property that they own. There is no federal, provincial, or municipal governance structure that requires or facilitates watershed scale planning. We in my company um, and when I was at the University of Victoria had been working on this creek since the early 80s. We had 20 years of background information but also 20 years of support from the community and the municipality. We offered to develop a watershed scale management planning process for all of the development that was taking place. The city accepted, the feds in the province have signed off on this process, and every single development. So I'm just going to use the arrow to indicate there's development here. We're meeting on these three properties at 11 o'clock today. We've developed this property already. This one's in the process of being developed. We're working on these two that are in blue, and we just got fourth reading for this project uh, on Monday night, and this is a much larger project that we, we'd worked on over the past five years, and there's a very substantial proposal on this golf course planned sometime in the next 10 years. So the key in this particular municipality is to understand how each development must contribute to regenerating and rejuvenating the functional condition of each segment of the landscape. What's fascinating is it enables us to integrate between developments. So on this particular site right here are a couple of old abandoned dugouts and a large stormwater detention pond built when they built this major connecting highway here. We need to take those off the landscape, but what we're going to do is replace them with a brand new lake down here on public property, which typically wouldn't be permissible under the normal design and governance practices of urban development. By taking a watershed scale plan, we can actually understand how to engage in mitigative strategies so that on every single project, there is enhancement, rejuvenation, and regeneration of ecosystem function but in every case, it begins with restoring the aquatic habitat. Something else that we've worked on quietly for the last few years, and this next slide is an aerial overview of this large watershed um, that flows through much of the regional district called the Colquitts River, still has salmon and trout in it, so what we've been doing is to use the basic science, this proper functioning condition, what we call PFC, to go in and assess every single reach of every creek, of every wetland, of every pond, of every lake. And what you see in the diagram are three colors. So you've got red, which means that reach is non-functional. If it's yellow, it's functional at risk. That is, it's, it has most of the processes and attributes that you require but there are a couple of key missing, and if it's green, then it means it's functional. So we're using this to develop modules of opportunity to restore a very large watershed and to give the community and developers indications of where they should be investing those scarce resources they're able to bring to the table. I'd like to just quickly run through a couple of other projects, and the next slide um, lays, lays out the 2010 Olympic Village, this is for the uh, Winter Olympics in Vancouver, this is Southeast Falls Creek. College of the Desert, which is a project we've just completed um, with our American colleagues in California, and then this North Shore study called IRM, and I'll come back to that in a minute. On the North Shore uh, is a large um, scale property development that's been worked on since 1931. The developer owns a very substantial uh, block of property and is in the process of developing a 200-acre subdivision called Rogers Creek. And I just want to point out that 
if you go to the website for West Vancouver or the British Pacific properties, you'll be able to find the background information on this. These are extremely steep hillsides with dozens of uh, creeks and long linear watersheds, and the entire development of this subdivision was predicated upon understanding how to protect the ecology and the functional condition of every one of those creeks. So the ecology and the need to preserve and protect the health of that landscape is what drove the design process. Southeast Falls Creek is a 70-acre brownfield redevelopment, so about five times the size of um, Dockside Green. A tremendous amount of green infrastructure has gone into this. It's the second lead platinum community that I'm aware of in the world. And again, the marine environment was absolutely essential. But over the last 150 years, all of the stormwater or the rainwater runoff coming off these upper hillsides flowed through this community in culverts. And the original design intention was to both capture rainwater on the site and reuse it to reduce the overall amount of water coming out of our reservoirs, and at the same time to rebuild the ecology of this community. So here's an example of some of the early um, daylighting of creeks, and here's an example of one of the main channels flowing through the site taken a year apart. So the upper left is when we began the project and here is what it looked like uh, this last spring. And this is the next slide is one of the islands uh, that we rebuilt. And again, the complexity of this island um, is revealed in the microhabitats that were created as we make the transition from rainwater coming in from the upper part of the watershed and mixing with the marine environment. I'm only going to spend a second on the College of the Desert. This is well worth looking up on the, on the web. This is in Palm Springs. The Board of Trustees of this um, post-secondary education, this university college, decided that there is a green economy coming at us like a freight train. We are going to have to address how to adapt to a changing climate. And therefore, they should be the first out of the gate to build a brand new university college campus to train people, to educate them in the design, the operation, and maintenance of what the new green economy is going to look like. At the core of this project, of course, because it's in the desert, is water. And the master plan for this campus was completed last week, and construction will begin probably within a month as detailed design drawings start coming online. What's fascinating about this particular process is the Board of Trustees agreed to adopt the simplest of all design constraints for a green community. The campus is the curriculum. This will not be a standard landscape where you teach funky courses in a traditional building. Every single aspect of the design of every square foot will scream sustainable design to anybody that comes on the campus. So the campus buildings, the landscape that they function in, actually is the beginning of every course that anybody on the campus will take. It's a fascinating uh, design process. Uh, we're in the home stretch. The North Vancouver um, portion of the regional district consists of about 200,000 people, three municipalities, two First Nations, and they have some very old infrastructure and are looking at trying to think of what the 21st century could look like rather than build what they've designed and operated for the last 100 years. And the next set of slides simply indicates a study that we undertook to provide a radically different alternative to urban infrastructure, beginning with, as I talked about earlier, the watershed scale thinking, working through energy, integrating water with energy, and moving all the way up to green building design. This is about resource recovery, reduction of greenhouse gases, significant conservation of water, and it's literally about understanding how to integrate at every level all of the aspects that make up our um, 
modern urban design. Sources of waste, replacing aging infrastructure, identifying space for new, new facilities, markets for reclaimed water and energy. The central plant design would be integrated with the recovery of waste heat, waste water, and literally building a dendritic system to get those resources back into the community so we don't need to supply them with new virginal resources or water every time they want to do something. This is a dramatic shift in the way we think about managing our landscapes. It's driven by the idea that these resources are sig provide significant revenues, and if our modeling is correct, it may be that that infrastructure will pay for itself over the life cycle of that infrastructure. Why is this relevant? Because it has a dramatic effect on the kinds of taxes that we may be facing, not maybe, are facing, with all of the aging infrastructure uh, in, in the West in particular. And this one graph on initial cost and net value simply indicates in f five different case studies, as you increase the degree of integration, the revenue sources go up. There are initial higher capital costs to build it, but at the end of the day, as the last case shows, it may be that it generates, over the lifespan of that project, more revenue than it costs to build it and operate it. Very significant reduction in greenhouse gases occur all the way along. So to end, I have two final slides. The first is an old Chinese proverb. If you're thinking one year ahead, sow seed. If you're thinking 10 years ahead, plant trees. If you're thinking 100 years ahead, we have to educate the people to do things differently. And the last slide is from Professor John Downing. And what I would simply like to point out is in all of the global climate change modeling that we've been looking at for the last decade, this is the IPCC and many others, fresh water on the landscape is not included in this modeling. If Downing and others' work coming out over the last couple of years is correct, it may turn out that these small hyper-eutrophic landscape ponds, small uh, dugouts, uh, riparian zones, sequester more carbon than all of the jungles, the savannas, the forests, and the oceans combined. And while that sounds completely impossible, the key is to understand that these riparian zones, these small aquatic ecosystems that are incredibly rich and diverse, turn carbon over at rates that are 1,000 to 10,000 times faster than what we see in upslope dryland environments or in the, in the oceans. And we've completely ignored this flux issue. So it may be that one of the ways of literally adapting to a changing climate is to understand that peeling back the pavement actually is the salvation, profitable salvation, and is one of the simplest and easiest things we can do and enhances the value of the communities that we live in. I'll leave it at that and turn it back over to Laura. Thanks so much, Patrick. So we have about 13 minutes by my uh, clock here for a question period. Um, if any of you have any questions for either Suzanne or Patrick or for both of them, um, please start typing them in the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner. And while you're starting to do that, um, I do want to make all of you aware that in the new year, uh, we will be planning a more focused follow-up webinar on this topic. Um, and it will be targeted at practitioners, and it will be more participatory in nature. So the details are still being ironed out. They will be forthcoming. Uh, but if that is something that sounds like it may be of interest to you um, or your unit, please send me a note um, in my email. You should all have it. It's communications at polisproject.org. So I see a few people are typing. We'll just wait for the questions to come rolling in. So Suzanne, if you're muted, you may want to unmute yourself.
I can hear some people talking. Um, it's not overly distracting, but if you don't want us all eavesdropping, you may want to uh, make sure that your line is muted. Okay, so I have the first question here from Karen Nickrat. Um, and the question is, what role or roles can community water stewardship groups play in low density areas? Um, specifically, she's interested in the Columbia Basin of British Columbia. Um, perhaps I can <laughs> respond to that because I actually live there. Um, we work both in the Rocky Mountain Trench because we live in the East Kootenays uh, as well as um, here in Victoria. <clears throat> and I think they have a very important role to play um, in terms of both helping to collect the long-term information that we need on these um, headwater systems and at the same time, working with municipalities and uh, developers to rethink how we're going to manage these urban systems. And uh, if anybody's interested, we've been working on this now since the early 90s in Cranbrook and Kimberley, and we've taken this to actually another level, and we use all of the principles I've just described to manage the community watersheds so that these the water supplies in these two towns meet or exceed every drinking water quality standard in the world without filtration. And at the same time, these are not protected watersheds per se. They're logged, they're mined, people recreate in them, we have cattle grazing in them. And at the same time, we don't require treatment. In the city of Cranbrook, over the first 10 years of the project, the financial officer indicated we'd save the city in excess of $25 million. So there's an enormous amount um, these water stewardship groups can do. And as I say, we've been working with a number of them for um, the last almost 20 years um, in the East Kootenays. I just wanted to see Dan here, and I just wanted to add in um, that in Peeling Back the Pavement, we have actually um, a case study that looks at um, grassroots and kind of multi-jurisdictional approaches to a specific project. And that project happened here, Boker Creek, the Boker Creek Initiative happened here again in our neck of the woods. And um, Laura, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you actually researched and wrote it. I don't know if you wanted to say a couple words about that kind of initiative and just in response to Karen's question, how that kind of worked out. Yeah, the, the Boker Creek, Creek Initiative was... Um, quite interesting and, and quite inspiring, I think, because um, there were, I, I don't know all of the details off the top of my head, but as Suzanne said, it is in, it is in the handbook. Um, but it was the university, it was, I believe, three different municipalities um, all worked together, as well as the local community. Um, and the initiative was started by um, a local community group who was wanting to improve the quality of this creek. Um, and it sort of snowballed into this um, very positive um, initiative, um, and they have now created a, a long-term blueprint for um, restoring this um, waterway within the urban environment. So the next question, I'm going to move on because we're because we're tight on time, is from Justin Hawker. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Has anyone done methane production studies on slow moving, that is low slope topographical, uh, riparian system? Yes, there's Patrick here. There's 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 actually a substantial um, body of information in in the scientific literature on this. Um, again, the it's essential to understand that when we're running these kinds of studies in terms of methane production or hydrogen sulfide production, that we understand the condition of the system that we're referring to uh, or that's under study and. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head uh, of some research um, that you could go to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, Patrick um, Mulholland would be a good source. Um, I would check um, Robert Wetzel's work. He's now out of the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Um, I would also go to uh, John Downing. Uh, who's now at Iowa. He was in, um, I think, McGill before, but he's now in, in, uh, in Iowa. Um, there's a, there is an awful lot of work on this. 
increasingly this work is being focused on the boreal forest and the um, uh, more frozen areas beyond the boreal forest in the north where methane production as these landscapes uh, remain um, frost free for much longer periods um, is beginning to add very, very significant concentrations of methane to the uh, atmosphere. Great. Um, and I wonder, Patrick, if you wouldn't mind, perhaps Justin could get in touch with you to get some of those names that you that you rhymed off. Uh, if he, uh, just, he can just uh, email me. Okay. Um, so the next question that we have here is from Satya Mohapatra, um, directed at Patrick. Energy from solid waste is a good idea but many oppose incineration. Which technologies do you suggest? Not incineration. Um, and please, for everybody that's listening, there's an enormous amount of emotional um, turmoil over this concept of incineration. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, closed system gasification. Uh, there's a wide range of technologies. And the question that um, Sasha has just put on is absolutely at the core of everything we're talking about. It's one of the most important questions anyone can ask for the rest of their life. It's about not asking what technology we should use, but rather this whole integrated resource management approach that we're talking about here says at the very beginning, first you have to understand how to integrate a particular landscape. Once you understand what is required, you can then begin to ask the question, what optimal technology um, complexes should we be using? The reason we've got into trouble over the last 100 years is we start with some guy walking in the door saying, have I got the best technology for you? <clears throat> it works. It's a good technology. Somebody else says, hey, boy, I'd like some of that. And that technology spreads across the landscape without ever anyone asking, I wonder if we should have done that in the first place. So if you review this report, the most recent report we've done on the North Shore, which is available on the web, called Integrated Resource Recovery for the North Shore, it begins with the most important point. First, you actually understand how that landscape functions, and you use that understanding to then optimize the kinds of technologies that you should be using. Incineration was never and is not a consideration. Gasification, which is completely different, is a very valuable technology to use. I hope that answers the question properly. Okay, we are nearing the end of our time and there doesn't seem to be any more questions coming in. So just before I bid you all a wonderful rest of your day, I do want to draw your attention to our upcoming webinar. Uh, we have webinars coming up in January, March, and May. The topics are there. If any of them are, again, of interest to you, please send me an email and I will sign you up. And to view our archived webinars, I know some of you were on the line for our um, webinar on um, EU water governance. Um, that is now online, and for those of you who missed it, you may be interested. You can head to polisWaterProject.org slash outreach slash webinars. Um, and again, if any of you think you may be interested in a more focused practitioner webinar on today's topic, please send me a note as well, and I'll file that away for when we have the details. So that is that. I thank you all for coming. I hope to see you all here again in the future, and farewell. Patrick and Suzanne, do you want to say a sign-off? Thanks, everyone.